Hi, I'm Dr. David Dobson. Welcome to Conversations. Today, my guest is Dr. Paul Bowles. Paul is a professor in the Merrill College of Communication at Washington State University. He has over 25 years of experience applying psychophysiological measures in research on how the human mind processes and responds to media content and technology. His current research is on the application of media psychophysiology in health and political communication. He earned his PhD from Indiana University. It's a great pleasure to have you with me today, Paul. Uh, the, ple the pleasure is all mine, David. You started out your career working in commercial radio. Tell me what drove your interest in commercial broadcasting. Well, you'd think there'd be some kind of fascinating, interesting story, but uh, there's honestly not. Um, I, I, I was a kid. And um, I made friends with a local radio DJ in Belgrade, Montana, uh, and thought I wanted to be the next great rock and roll DJ. Um, so I uh, put my mind to, to that. Um, this friend helped me cut my first audition tape, um, and I was just persistent and beat down the door of the general manager at a radio station that gave me my first shot and then ended up working most of my radio career. I was in commercial radio for a total of eight years. I uh, worked most of my radio uh, career in Bozeman, Montana, at a little station called KBOZ, a fa fantastic experience um, in small market radio because I got to wear a lot of different hats yeah. working at a small market radio station. And so, you know, it was really just just kind of kind, kind of a kind of a kid generated dream to be to be a rock and roll DJ. And, and I had a ton of fun doing it. What sparked your interest to switch from industry to academia? Well, once again, uh, you'd, you'd think there might be might be some kind of awe-inspiring, <laughs> eye-opening event, but not really. Uh, yeah, I I I, uh, I I grew up and realized that I was not going to be the next great rock and roll DJ, yeah. and I better figure out another path in life. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, in all seriousness. Uh, I was um, so incredibly blessed that um, while I was working in radio, um, the station I worked at, KBOZ, um, highly supported me, um, you know, in pursuing my college education at Montana State University um, for my bachelor's degree. Um, and at Montana State, um, I had professors that saw things in me that I couldn't see uh -huh. uh, and, and encouraged me and inspired me to pursue undergraduate research experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that experience, you know, they they got me to believe that um, I could pursue graduate education and ultimately evolve into this communication scientist that I am today. Your research focuses on holistic media and mind science, which you call brain-friendly media. Can you explain this research approach? I love the term brain friendly, and I've gotten a whole lot of mileage out of brain friendly media and using that as a catchphrase. phrase. Um, and, and by the way, I've watched your program. It is very brain friendly. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so so uh, to simplify the definition of brain friendly media, um, it simply means it's, it's media content and technology that is strategically designed, developed, and delivered uh -huh. in a way that works with how the brain is actually structured and functions okay. in processing and responding to information in the environment. Okay. I mean, that's really all it is. Um, yeah. and so brain friendly has become my kind of catch term okay. from media that is strategically designed to, um, if it's journalism, uh, make people actually make people smarter about the world around them because it's news that's designed the way the, the brain works. If it's advertising, it's, it's designed to effectively and positively represent the brand and sell the product. If, uh -huh. it's, inter if it's an entertainment experience, yeah. it delivers a, a, a rewarding, enjoyable, emotional experience uh -huh. all grounded in how the human brain works. That's uh -huh. brain media. Holistic okay. mind science uh -huh. comes in because 
Ultimately, the research is fundamentally about advancing scientific insight into how the human mind takes in, processes, evaluates, and responds to all things media, content, and technology. Yeah. Um, and holistic means mm -hmm. that we've got to, um, as scientists mm -hmm. working in this realm of media, content, and technology processes and effects, mm -hmm. we've got to understand the entirety of human experience with media. Our society is increasingly becoming dependent and impacted by media content and technology in every, every realm. Uh, my hot button realm is obviously politics and health. Yeah. Um, and so I think as scientists, we've got to understand human experiences with media from physiological data that I can measure in my lab with measures like EEG, um, linguistic data. We got to ask people you know, what they think and what they say about their experiences with media and obviously behavioral response. Yeah. Um, and, and, and implication of media content and technology. Right. You are interested in applying this research approach to human health and wellness. Uh, why is this important for you? Well, um, so I have um, I have a deep personal history, and 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 I think in this conversation we'll get to that in a couple minutes. Um, that um, drives my passion for informing and producing actionable insight into advancing positive effects of media content and technology. Um, and I define human health and wellness very broadly. Um, you know, some of my some of my early work has been on uh, um, experiments on how smokers process anti-tobacco messaging. Right. You know, kind of traditional health com work. Um, but um, I'm also interested in the implications for, of media literacy, um, politics. You know, health decision making has become increasingly politicized. Um, and I think that's a in large part of media effect. Um, and I think as communication scientists, you know, I, I love the way that one of the most legendary communication scientists in the history of the discipline, Steve Chafee put it. He, he always argued that our fundamental mission as communication scientists is to use communication science to make the world a better place. Right. So my interest in informing how media content and technology can have positive effects by understanding how the human brain processes and responds to media content and technology. That's my small way of very optimistically hoping that the work I do can, can somehow help humanity. And, and one thing I'd like to add is, is a little bit into the deeply personal side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Please. Well, I, I have some personal experience with um, um, with the uh, negative negative side of health and wellness, um, and so uh, and so that that fuels my personal passions around this area. In a recent LinkedIn post, you wrote that science, spirituality, and your personal life are entangled. Can you explain what this means? Yeah. Um, the way I've evolved as a, as a communication scientist is all of my scientific work is deeply personal. Um, take my interest in politics. Um, um, you know, obviously, we're not going to go into the details of this in this uh, conversation. Um, but um, um, growing up, uh, my dad was part of, uh, this is an example of the deeply personal nature here. Okay. Uh, growing up, my dad was part of a far right politically extremist militia group in Montana called the Montana Freeman. Um, in the 1990s, they had a standoff with federal agents. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so, you know, that part of my personal life history um, makes media and politics a deeply personal communication science topic to me. Um, 
spirituality. Um, you know, I'm blessed to be working in the in an area where my entire scientific mission rests on my ability to understand the human mind as it's embodied in the brain and 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 how human nature exists and how humans are as as life forms um and that automatically enters the realm of the metaphysical and consciousness um and understanding you know you know understanding that my science can only go so far in explaining human nature and human experiences with media content and technology and that human beings are more than a collection of neurons and nervous systems and 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 bodies that interact in an environment um that that there's something more to a human being that's what i mean by intersecting the spiritual well uh, and and along with um you know, I'm, I'm a scientist where I'm not um, I'm not afraid to to let my faith, um, you know, impact my science. Some. Um, I think my my faith perspective and spirituality um, drives my motivation to use my science to improve the human condition um, through media, content and technology. Um, and then the scientific, um, you know, my challenge is um, to have credibility as a communication scientist. I'd better be a rigorous scientist um, and know how to be a rigorous scientist. Um, the phenomenon that I study, um, you know, the human mind and brain, I would argue it's the most complex phenomenon in existence. And so if I want to shed any kind of valid insight into the phenomena that I study, I darn well be a, better be a rigorous scientist. So all, all that really just intertwines together, um, mi mixes together. Um, my science, because of the personal and the faith, it's fundamentally emotional and cognitive. Right. So you do find a balance in, in, in this aspect and, and I, that, that keep you going. Yeah, well, you know, I um, there there's a phrase, you know, I, I've I've been at this career now for 24 years, um, at several different universities, starting several different labs, um, and just came off of my associate dean contract, um, and uh, and there's a phrase that has just deeply resonated me lately with me lately, a saying. It's, it goes like this. You're not burned out because you're doing too much. You're burned out because you're not doing enough of what you love. Right. And <laughs> I honestly think that it's, it's, it's the frustrating, rewarding um, yeah. roller coaster ride. Yeah. Balancing. The personal, the spiritual, and the yeah. scientific right. actually fundamentally creates work that I love. And so, and so, you know, I yeah. am I perfect in achieving that balance? Absolutely not. Mm. And I never will be. Mm. Um, mm. But it's the process of, mm. of, of struggling through that balance. Mm. that I think makes being a research professor mm. something I love. Right. Um, finally, what advice do you have for new grad students? Three pieces. Okay. <laughs> Keep it nice and simple and straightforward. Three ideas. Number one, be intellectually humble. So I hear a lot of grad students and colleagues, um, both in person and on social media, talking about imposter syndrome yeah. and the challenges of imposter syndrome. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've yet to, in, in it, all the advice in dealing with imposter syndrome, which is, you know, this 
chronic dysfunctional fear that you don't belong. Yeah. Um, and devaluing yourself, honestly, yeah. I think that the most powerful antidote to imposter syndrome, yeah. and my students need to hear this, actually, yeah. all of them need to hear this. Yeah. I think the most powerful antidote to imposter syndrome is intellectual humility. Mm. Um, if, if anyone viewing this wants to get a good understanding of intellectual humility, I encourage you to look at the work, the scientific work mm -hmm. being done on intellectual humility. Uh, most of it funded or a lot of it funded by the Templeton Foundation. Okay. Um, you know, when you're intellectually humble, mm -hmm. you don't have this pressure of being right and correct. Yeah. And, and, and 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 writing more journal articles than the next person and than your colleagues. You don't have this pressure of looking around and seeing, oh my gosh, you know, I'm I'm my 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 cohort is doing this and I'm not doing that and you know so on and so forth. And you drive yourself nuts. Yeah. Intellectual <laughs> humility gives you a lot of freedom. Right. It's pretty nice to have the freedom to be wrong. <laughs> not something. Well said. <laughs> um you know, and 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 so I think intellectual be intellectually humble. Yeah. Uh, number two. Okay. Be intellectually curious. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what fuels research and insight, um, and and helps grad students develop a breadth of education. Because you're curious and an intellectual curiosity will fuel an entire career worth of research. Number three, learn how to think. Push yourself to learn how to think, how to think in new and novel ways. Learn about epistemology, about paradigm. Um, one trend in graduate education that I'm somewhat concerned about. Um, just coming off of being an associate dean of research and graduate studies, one trend in graduate education that concerns me um, is um, is potentially premature and too much enthusiasm for learning research methods and sophisticated data analysis techniques mm -hmm. and um, and 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 tools and coding and mm -hmm. so forth. That's that's great. All that is great stuff and and absolutely crucial to good science. But the foundation of science is thinking, learning how to think so that your research doesn't simply mm -hmm. contribute repetitive mm -hmm. description of phenomena, yeah. but your research actually has a shot of explaining phenomena. There's a difference between the de description and explanation. Um, last thing I would say is just in general, don't be afraid to let your personal passions yeah. fuel your research interests while also remembering to be a rigorous scientist. Right. We touched on that a couple of minutes ago. It's kind of the mind that, you know, what if, what if you achieve is not on your own. There are people behind you and, and then they are contributing a success. So you need to, I mean, you need to remember that success is not your alone. So I, so I think that the thank you part is very important. I think that's very, it's part of humbling as well, you know, being humble and then thankful kind of go together. <laughs> well, well, and I think, um, you know, when you reach, um, when you reach what I call this kind of middle age to old age status, yeah. In your career, yeah, um, it, it's easy to lose touch with a posture yeah. of, of yeah. humility, yeah, and gratitude, yeah, like you're saying. And so, but uh, today you've 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 been part of my journey and helped me on my journey. So I'm grateful for you. Thank you for your time, Paul. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, David. <laughs>